Hello, everybody. My name is Gene Scher. Uh, so basically, my work is in the neuroevolution through Erlang. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Central Florida now. Uh, today, we're going to cover, in this particular uh, topic, uh, I'm going to introduce biological neural networks and uh, artificial neural networks. Then we're going to discuss what is necessary for a programming language to be perfect for this particular uh, research area or particular domain in general. Then we're going to elaborate on exactly why Erling is such a perfect fit for this. And then I'm going to give you a case study of the system I developed called DXNN and then discuss the future projects within the area. So the objectives of this is, of course, uh, elaborate on why Erling is a great fit for this type of research and discuss uh, the first use of such uh, development of such a system using Erlang and promote Erlang within the science. If none of you are, if some of you are not, for example, using Erlang but doing research in this area, then this is me promoting Erlang for you to use it. All right, so biological neural networks. They're uh, chemical uh, signal integrators. The brain is just a vast network of 100 billions of neurons connected together, processing signals. Uh, standard neuron accepts uh, inputs in uh, dendrite areas and a uh, soma cell body, processes them, and then creates an output and forwards it to other neurons. Now, a standard uh, neuron performs a spatiotemporal signal integration, uh, and the signal is encoded actually in the frequency and the phase. This actually means that uh, the neuron, when it accepts signals, they arrive the voltage charges arrive at the axon hillock at different times. If at a particular time there is enough charge, then the axon hillock generates an action potential and forwards the signal to other neurons. This means that the general, it's actually a rather complex processing element because uh, not only the frequency is important, but also the, the phase of the whole spiking network. So the whole th system is this sequence encoded and phase encoded uh, process. Now, also one of the most important and, uh, part that of the neuron that makes it so powerful, the signal integrator, is its ability to learn. And it makes us, gives us the ability to learn in general. Uh, the plasticity of the neuron is what allows it to learn. It can produce uh, new axon extensions, new dendrite branches, and of course increase or decrease the number of receptors. Therefore changing the way it processes signals and gives you the ability to memorize and learn new things. Artificial neural networks are mathematical abstractions of this biological system. They're very simplified. Of course, you can simplify them at different levels of precision. But the most basic one is as follows. It's just a node that accepts input signal, sort of like from other exons, and it weighs them. And this is analogous to receptors. The weight of a particular signal specifies how important the signal is. Then you aggregate everything together and put them through some form of activation function. Usually it is a sigmoid or hyperbolic tangent activation function. And that output is forwarded to other neurons. Here's an input. The input is basically a simple vector, right? Because each signal we can accumulate into a list, form a vector, send it to the neuron. The neuron has weights, which are themselves vector, and then dot together, put through threshold function, and forward to other neurons. Now, when you put this together, we are starting to simulate a uh, neural network. This is the simplest one. It's composed of three neurons, uh, feed forward connected. The signal here coming from some receptor forward to neuron A and B, which process the signal forward to C. This particular neuron is, uh, this particular neural circuit actually is a uh, XOR logic operator. So you can see it here. With this particular set of weights, it can emulate the XOR operator. Continuing to extend this uh, type of uh, neural network system, we have larger neural network systems, again, feed forward connected or recurrent. Now, recurrency in neural networks allows them to have um, a memory. For example, if a neuron outputs a signal that feeds back into itself, that means that the second later time step, it has the input, something that already output beforehand, which means it can remember signals of itself. So in this way, we can form networks that sort of form rudimentary levels of memory. Attaching sensors and actuators to the neural network gives us a neural network-based agent, which you can then use uh, for your problems. Now, of course, all of these things, you know, the, we already can see that they're concurrent and everything else, but uh, how do you set up those particular 
topologies or uh, weights or all the parameters that are available in these functions? Well, the, there are two approaches, the supervised and unsupervised. One of the most common and constantly used is, of course, the backpropagation uh, approach, supervised learning approach, where you have to have beforehand a set of uh, a data set where you already know what the answers are, right? You have the inputs and already expected outputs. And through that, you can use gradient descent to send to the neuron those inputs for which you already have the output, and then see what the neural network outputs, and based on its output, calculate the error between the expected output and its output, and using gradient descent, update all the synaptic weights. But again, this doesn't really solve the problem of uh, topology. Now, unsupervised learning is uh, our ability to give these neurons their ability to change as they process data. The simplest one is, of course, the Hebbian learning rule. Uh, I'm quoting uh, Heb when he says, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. This is basically an internal algorithm within a neuron that uh, gives it the ability to modify its uh, synaptic weights based on the signals it processed before. OK, but how do we set all these parameters, right? We still, even when we have a system that can update its own synaptic weights, we still don't know how to set the parameters that specify how to update those weights, or even topology in the first place. So how do we solve it? Well, another uh, also distributed approach to computation is, of course, evolutionary computation. Now, neural networks we've already seen, they're basically concurrent uh, processes, right? Evolution works on concurrent agents. And it's also, again, an approach that we, we know works, right? I mean, we're the result of billions of years of evolution. And here, uh, it's very simple. You know, we have a huge population. They're all competing, performing. Some of the agents will, of course, be bad at some particular problem for which they're competing. Those agents will be selected and uh, with greater probability than their competitors. And we allow them the chance to create offspring, basically some variations of themselves. In this manner, we can loop through the algorithm, creating better, better agents. Uh, one of the particular very simple encodings, but you know, evolution computation, it's applied to a particular genotype. Uh, in biological organisms, right, that's the DNA. But uh, here, for example, we have a string of, of ones and zeros. That's the genotype. And the phenotype, what they're representing, is a, some kind of a four block structure. Uh, for example, in this case, let's assume that uh, the whole goal is to be able to better blend in into the environment, right? that is green. So obviously the more green you have in you, the better you're able to blend in. So a simple mutation uh, in a genetic algorithm can be as follows. We start off with uh, four agents. We calculate how much green they have in them. Three of them have two greens and one of them does not. So we choose half the population with uh, two greens and then remove the other two. Then we perturb them, just randomly choosing which uh, bits are gonna be perturbed to one or zero to create offspring. One of the offspring is three greens, obviously it's more fit. And the next time we choose that one, eventually we get a very fit agent that's completely green and able to blend into this environment. Of course, biological organisms and simulated evolution uh, also use crossover. In which case, instead of simply perturbing these uh, genotypes, we take two agents or more, and then we split them at some point, combine the genetic material to produce new ones. In this case, Again, the new agent combined from uh, these two parts has three greens, and this one also has three greens. And eventually, same way we can produce ones with uh, all four. So these are just ways you can perform uh, genetic algorithms on uh, different genotypes. Genetic programming is basically further extension. Instead of using a string of zeros and ones, you're applying, you're also just, you can come up with ways what the mutation operators can represent. In before, it was just perturbing a bit from zero to one. In this case, uh, we decided the genotype is not gonna be a string, it's gonna be a tree, and with the phenotype being the function. Again, we decide then if it's a tree, then our particular mutation operators are going to be uh, adding new nodes to the tree, right? And if it's crossover, then we can uh, swap subtrees. The, all of these things, uh, they've been here for a long time, and they're actually quite, kind of different sides of the same coin. They're, you can choose any genotype, you can choose any problem and then create an encoding for the genotype encoding and then come up with a few uh, ways to just change it, the mutations. 
So for example, here we have a, a genetic programming system, so it's a tree encoded uh, genotype, but it's really is just a graph encoded, right? It's the same thing. And a graph encoded system is basically a neural network. So we can move directly from here all the way to using the same kind of algorithm to uh, neural networks, to perturb and mutate neural networks. In the same way, we can, of course, continue extending this. Uh, we can evolve and mutate circuits. So then, we found that uh, neural networks are highly distributed uh, systems, right? Completely concurrent. All elements work in biological systems in a concurrent manner. And there is uh, an algorithm that we can use to mutate and change and produce new agents, neural network-based agents, that are better for, for solving some kind of problem. And that algorithm itself is an uh, evolutionary algorithm and itself also concurrent. So what would be, if we wanted to create some kind of programming language that is perfect for these type of problems, what uh, should it be? I mean, we already have hardware, right, that's improving. Just recently, for example, Xeon Phi coprocessor has been released. It's 60 cores, one, terif one teraflop of performance, uh, all x86, so general cores. And you know, we're scaling outwards. This is just going to continue in this direction. But the programming languages that we have at our disposal to do research in this area, are, do not have a, they have a conceptual gap when we're trying to build these very concurrent, uh, very distributed you know, network-based agents. So if you had a chance from the very beginning to uh, develop a programming language just for this domain, what would it be, right? What would you want it to have? Well, obviously, uh, you want the system to be able to handle an enormous number of uh, neurons, right? And of course, they have to be performed at a certain time or within a certain time. Uh, systems should also be able to be distributed among multiple machines, clusters even. Because both, for example, if you're doing evolution, then you have thousands of agents, right, large populations. And it's in, the, in the neural network itself, you have multiple processes, multiple neurons working together. So both of these require scaling that you can distribute over multiple machines. Uh, of course, you should be able to interact with hardware. That's a very important thing, right? Evolutionary robotics, afterwards, uh, what are you using the neural networks for? You have to apply them to something. And robotics is one of the very important fields. So interacting with hardware, controlling hardware, is something that you want your language to have. Of course, the systems have to be very large. But if you're thinking ahead, if you're, for example, thinking not just applying it to uh, you know, currency trading or robotics, but if you're thinking like, you know, maybe it's possible to do the singularity, right? Then you want systems that are incredibly advanced, right? You want them to be able to rewrite themselves. I mean, that's kind of the holy grail, right? You want the system to be able to not just think, but then have the ability to write its own source code and so on. So you want for your programming language to be a support code hot swapping as well, if you're going in that direction. Uh, and of course, you want it to be highly robust, full tar tolerant, and you know, so you can operate for many years. You don't want your system to just crash from one little bug. Interestingly enough, uh, oops. <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, Dacker wasn't talking about a neural network programming language. He was actually talking about a language for telecom switching systems. And uh, that's Erlang. Erlang ends up having pretty much all the requirements we want. Uh, it has a perfect mapping, perfect mapping for the processes are neurons. It has concurrency, uh, full detection primitive, so your system doesn't crash you know, from a single bug. Uh, you, you, it even supports um, hardware interaction. It's, it has its own fault tolerant uh, database. So actually, Erlang seems to be the perfect language. It's exactly what we've been looking for. It has a conceptual one-to-one -one mapping. Here, for example, we have a neural network sensor, sensor, a bunch of neurons interconnected, and actuators. And represented in Erlang, it's direct. It's a process it's sending each other messages, interacting with each other, and controlling hardware through actuators. Having this kind of uh, perfect uh, conceptual mapping, is, I think, is very important because it allows you to think about problem directly instead of switching between, you know, thinking about, okay, how am I going to build this in, uh, I don't know, assembly language, and how am I going to, what is actually, is it doing? What is the hard, you know, how is it working? So this allows you to tackle much larger problems without doing this context switching. So I believe this gives us an advantage. And I'll discuss, I mean, many of you are probably thinking, yeah, but uh, you, know, you have thousands of neurons, there's gonna be a huge number of messages. It might not be very efficient. I'll, uh, I'll actually discuss that particular area towards the end. 
So DXNN is a such a new solution system. It's a platform that evolves highly robust, advanced uh, neural network-based systems that I've developed a few years ago. Uh, so neural, it's a mimetic algorithm-based topology and weight evolving artificial neural network, which means instead of, it's sort of like genetic, but mimetic means you simply separate the local search and global search phases, which has shown in research and benchmarking that has certain advantages when you're evolving systems. So it's a simple uh, approach of application of evolution to neural networks. You start with a seed neural network population, which is very simple, it can be just one neuron each. And then you apply it to some problem that you have, doesn't matter which one. You calculate the fitness, how it performs, you select the most fit organisms within the population, you create uh, offspring from them, permutations and different mutations. Then you apply to the problem again, go through the cycle again and again. In a metric algorithm though, you don't simply do this, you also, you apply to the same problem multiple times while at the same time tuning the synaptic weights and other local parameters. So that's the difference. So the parametric mutations can be as follows, you know, we have a, uh, whether it uses, whether the neuron uses plasticity or does not. So you can permute between non or HEB or OJUST or some other algorithm or function. Then of course activation functions, yeah, usually it's a hyperbolic tangent or sigmoid, but it can also be nothing, it can be linear or sine or Gaussian. So you can permute between when you're applying these uh, local search uh, mutation operators. And of course you can permute the different uh, synaptic weights by adding and subtracting random weights. So here's for example when you're, the, the local search is basically applying stochastic hill climber to a random set of neurons in the neural network based agent. In this case we start with some particular synaptic weight and the, the whole neural network agent is based out of a single neuron. We apply, we perturb its uh, synaptic weight check how it performs, how the whole neural network performs with this new synaptic weight. If it doesn't perform as well, we retract it to the previous synaptic weight, apply a new perturbation and try again. And this way we can sort of optimize the, the weights for the neural network until the neural network has the uh, appropriate synaptic weights to function properly. Now, a global search in this mimetic algorithm is the mutation, topological mutation of the neural network. Again, just like in uh, tree encoded systems, in graph encoded systems, we come up with our own uh, mutation operators that evolve a mutated topology. In this case, we can start with a single uh, four neuron, neural network based agent. And uh, one uh, mutation operator can be add a neuron. So we randomly create a new neuron, add it here and connect it randomly to and from some random selection of uh, synaptic weights uh, here. And here we have splice, which basically it takes two neurons that are connected to each other, disconnects them and reconnects them through the newly created neuron. Here we're just adding new connections and from and two sensors and from and two neurons. So we just come up with our own mutation operators. And of course we have to apply this uh, to the whole populations, right? So we, have, we start off with a, a population of neural networks and we're trying to evolve again XOR, a logic operator. So we check how close, each one approximates the logic of your XOR, this one is the best, we choose this one to create new offspring through the application of uh, various mutation operators to create better ones until finally, apparently if you use a cos, it only takes a single neuron. Now, what it's, you can see already here probably is it requires very little explanation. We, it's pretty much process, process. You can pretty much think of it as Erlang rather than neural network. That's, that's I think, is you know, one of the beauties of uh, using Erlang because it's just so simple, the mapping, you don't, don't have to sort of think about anything, it's, it's right there. Uh, in DXNN, the whole neural network based agent is a relatively complex type of setup. It has all the distributed neurons, sensors, and actuators, but they're synchronized by another element that oversees them called the cortex. And then the whole system is again uh, monitored by ExoSelf. In this way, we also have a sort of a hierarchy that we can use to monitor the different neurons. So if something crashes, we can recuperate from the crash using this type of setup. Uh, this is another type of uh, agent that uses substrate encoding. Now, this particular encoding was popularized in the United States of Central Florida by Kenneth Stanley. Here, the neural network is sort of embedded in this uh, multidimensional substrate. It's a single process that has 
neurons located at different coordinates. Now, and you use a neural network, the one that's distributed and the one that you're evolving, you send it the, the coordinates of the different neurons and its output would be the connection strength and whether there is a connection between all these different neurons. So if we're using this, we only need to use this neural network at the very beginning of our experiment because as soon as it sets up the synaptic weights for all the neurons, right, then it's basically a single process. You don't need to reference this anymore until the next time you're mutating something. So this particular approach, for example, allows us to uh, change from using neurons as the concurrent processes to using an entire agent as a single concurrent process. So then our distribution is on the level of agents rather than neurons in the population. Uh, this is what the substrate looks like. It's basically, like I said, a multidimensional system. You can feed it some information the nodes are embedded in a particular uh, hyperplane, and they're connected to each other, which is defined how they're connected and their synaptic weights by the neural network. In this case, we have an example of an image being fed to it. This image is encoded as uh, pixels located at the coordinates z negative one. Each pixel has its also y and x coordinate, and if it's black or gray, it's uh, one or zero respectively, and there's nothing, then it's uh, negative one. This is one of the way it works. And of course, this particular uh, approach has been shown to work very well when your problem requires geometrical analysis or where the agents you're using in themselves already have geometry because you're actually using the neural network to process the coordinates rather than the actual signals. And it defines the actual structure of the whole thing. In some sense, if you think about it, you can have a three-dimensional space with billions of neurons and it's defined the way it looks how it's connected is defined by a neural network, which is itself a universal function approximator. So in some sense, it can, you can evolve very complex, yet regular uh, connections. Distribution continues at this level in my system uh, on the level of uh, population. So each agent is working concurrently with every, with every other agent. Once again, monitored by a, a process called population monitor, which performs the selection and the creation of a new offspring. So distribution is on the level of agents as well. And this is the, the architecture of the whole thing. So we have uh, just a background that's just platform. You, when you start the, this particular process, it starts the amnesia database and everything else that needs to, the simulation environments that have to, that support this whole evolution process. And then you have populations working concurrently, uh, monitoring their own particular species with monitoring their own agents. And the agents are interacting, again, completely decoupled uh, with the scapes. Now, scapes, it's an interesting thing. It's, uh, it's the way you present in my system the, the particular problem to the neural network-based agent. You call it a scape, which is a self-contained uh, simulation environment, self-contained process, or can be on a different machine. The whole thing that scape has to be able to do is uh, accept Sensor, sensor requests from the neural network agents from the sensors, which are programs, and then uh, accept uh, actuator signals from the neural network sent by the actuator to put some kind of you know, controlling and uh, using that command to do something within the environment that's simulating. For example, if we have an artificial life experiment, then the sensors send a sensory request and uh, the scape, first of all, it creates the avatar the simulated robot. And the sensor requests are basically what the robot is seeing with its sensors that's available to it, sending it to the neural network. The neural network does some processing and sends the actions through the actuators that the scape can then uh, look at and say, okay, so this is, you know, this is to control the differential drive of the agent. In the same way, the sensors can be requests from the database for new data. And the actuators can control whether to write to the database or move to the next position in the database. So it's a very uh, decoupled approach, so allowing you to separate and design your scapes and problems uh, separately from the whole system without having to touch it. Or even put the whole uh, scapes and simulations on different machines if you're doing evolution robotics, for example, and are using Gazebo or uh, Robot Operating System, ROS, if any of you use that. Now, finally, you, the, when you're creating an agent, applying it to, to a new problem, you also have to specify the, the morphology. In the morphology, that's where you specify what kind of sensors your system will use, what kind of actors it will use, and the scape it will communicate with. 
So you actually you can leave the whole system on its own. All you have to do is just define sensors and actuators and the actual problem, and uh, everything else can stay the same. In this case, we're talking about flat lenders, which are the simulated robots. Uh, here's a neuron, and uh, here we're getting to actually er Erlang finally. Uh, it's incredibly simple. This 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 whole thing, for example, a neuron is uh, in standard system it would be you know just a standard single neuron, but here, this this these two uh, lines define pretty much every possible type of neuron you might want to have, which is quite incredible. For example, here we have a, the output of the neuron, which is based on post-processors, applied to activation function, applied to signal integration, applied to preprocessors. And you have modules with a list of uh, preprocessors and postprocessors and activation functions. So if you, for example, using a, want to have a single standard neuron, you can have a hyperbolic tangent applied to a dot product of the input and the weights, right? But just as easily, you can mutate it by using the mutation operators to function completely differently. Like, for example, adaptive resonance, uh, adaptive resonance theory based uh, neuron, in which case you have a threshold applied to no activation function uh, with a difference between the synaptic weights and the normalized input. Here again, uh, a single neuron in under 80 lines of Erlang code. Now, this is not just a, just a basic neuron. First of all, Erlang allows us to so easily read this. It's actually readable. You, you know exactly what it does. But more importantly, this, this neuron supports plasticity and static-based computation. It supports Lamarckian and Darwinian-based evolution and can accept requests from um, the exosolf to update it, uh, to write itself back into the database, niche database. I mean, all under 80 lines. Because it's so simple and because this can be any neuron, as we discussed in the previous slide, because it can emulate any neuron, it's, uh, you can tackle problems that are significantly more complex and develop systems that are completely more complex and yet still be able to understand them and read them. That's a significant advantage, I believe, in this particular research area. For my system, I use Mnesia as a storage for the genotypes. Again, it's very friendly for this type of research because it's, uh, well, it's, the genotypes are very easily can be tuple encoded, and Mnesia can support that. Not to mention, uh, when you perform mutations and something goes wrong, Mnesia already can take care of it. Something goes wrong, it breaks, some, there's an error. You don't produce a faulty uh, neural network-based agent. It simply retracts the whole uh, mutation operator and you apply a new one. So it takes care of a number of problems on its own. Uh, here's, the, for example, the genotype. It's composed out of the population, which uh, keeps track of all the species, which keep track of all the agents. And the agent is a container that keeps track of all the cortex, sensor, actuator, and neuron elements, which all belong to their own tables. And here's a full genotype. Again, I think uh, it allows us to produce systems and genotypes that are very readable. So here, for example, we have a complete genotype, well, almost. Uh, with cortex sensor, neurons, and actuator, and you can actually uh, read it, which means you can work on it and, once again, try to cre create a better system more easily. Uh, the system I have recently updated, it started off using strange uh, mutation operators, but right now I have updated to use the Hall of Fame and archiving, which have significantly improved its performance. It's used now multi-objective optimization. It also incorporates and allows for the utilization of novelty search, which has become recently very popular. And it has um, also started to use most, my most recent research in the, is in the use of neural microcircuits and the utilization of uh, complex numbers in uh, neurons. And also now supports adaptive resonance theory. Now, we come, we're now coming back to the question. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of messages. And these neurons are not really very complex, right? So at some point, there is just, it's just not efficient. That's true if the neuron is very basic. But in more complex problems like artificial life, evolutionary robotics, each neuron is not just, uh, does not simply produce an activation function applied to a dot product, right? You have huge amounts of uh, algorithms that support plasticity, not just Hebbian. You can use uh, self-neuromodulation, which increases the amount of computation performed by each neuron by two to 10 times, depending on how complex the algorithm is. So that skews the messages to the amount of computation we do in our favor. Furthermore, 
I recently started using nodes instead of uh, standard neurons. You can now also use a node composed out of a two-layer feed-forward neural microcircuit. Now, feed-forward neural networks are universal function approximators, which means they can be anything. But a single neuron, right, it can't even perform nonlinear mapping. These are much more powerful elements, which are still manageable by a memetic algorithm. So the simplest one would be just two neurons. And this further increases the complexity of the node at which you're distributing your system by, by three times, roughly. So further putting it in our advantage. And I've, uh, I'll show you some benchmarks uh, to, in just a second. Here's the code for a neural micro circuit based node. Again, it's very simple, just how, how you can increase and change the complexity of the systems with just so little code. Furthermore, you can, this is a new uh, area of research I'm undertaking, is the using of uh, substrate encoded systems, which you embed the smaller substrates inside a larger one, and so the distribution at this is at the levels of these substrates, which can themselves be composed out of uh, a couple of hundred neurons. But because their synaptic weights and their topology and everything else is set up by the external neural network that you're actually evolving, it's completely manageable because you're actually operating on this one, the search space is still this small neural network, whereas the phenotype is much larger, and the distribution occurs where each processing, where each process is about 100 neurons. So again, this uh, improves your scaling. And again, uh, the system now also supports ArtMap-based agents. Uh, another approach to improving your uh, amount of uh, computation to the number of messages is through uh, what's called automatically defined functions. It's uh, actually an old approach from genetic programming. If you're applying a bunch of mutation operators and you're mutating, if you notice and you constantly keep a track, a counter, each neuron has a counter that keeps track of when was the last time that uh, something that it was either mutated or something that, that it's connected from has been mutated. And if these counters don't change for a long amount of time, because you know the only ones surviving, the only agents that are surviving are the ones who have not, who have this particular section not mutated then you simply cr transform this uh, small sub-circuit into its own uh, process. So once again, we can leverage this. And of course, uh, the grand goal is creating very large systems where you have different types of modules interconnected. So the benchmarks uh, for the system, it's actually ex excellent. Uh, so here's a standard double pole balancing benchmark. Uh, Classification, neural evolutionary based system, not particularly good at classification. The best approaches, as we know, is sort of support vector machines. But uh, the MoGuard, based on the art system, are very competitive now. And even they require a less amount of computation. But the double pole balancing benchmark is a uh, very, uh, it's commonly used benchmark for all such evolution systems. Pretty much every single other system has done it. Uh, the DXNL, the old one, was already uh, superseding others in it, uh, including a bunch of other more popular ones. The more recent one, the one that's using archiving and Hall of Fame, has further improved the performance. Uh, we can see the, the neural microcircuit approach is not quite as fast as the original one, but it has advantages when you're applying it to deceptive problems. And nevertheless, it is uh, when the problem becomes more complex, it does have the advantage, where it's, where it's more uh, simple, then the smaller approaches are better. Another uh, benchmark is artificial life, that the system has been applied, for example, food gathering, where the agents are interfaced with uh, simulated robots within some kind of flatland, and they have to run around and try to eat uh, particles using sensors such as color and range. And uh, their actuators are basically controlling the differential drive on the simulated robots. So again, the system very easily uh, was applied to it, and uh, excellent performance there. Dangerous food gathering benchmarks is where there's food particles, but also you uh, sort of put some poison around it. So they have to use the color-based sensor to avoid the poison particles and only try to uh, eat the food particles. So there's pretty much no, some change here, but uh, performs excellently. And uh, another uh, benchmark is, of course, predator versus prey, where you have now two populations competing against each other, where the prey population 
survives by eating food, and the predator population survives by hunting the prey. Actually, very interesting results, you can find them on YouTube, I uploaded them, uh, is uh, the behaviors that evolved were, were interesting and very complex. The predators learned how to sort of push around all the food particles into a single zone, and then they would hide behind the food particle because uh, ray casting is used for the range sensors and color sensors, so that the prey would eventually uh, they wouldn't see the, the predators hiding behind the food. They would only see the food particles. Eventually, they get very hungry, obviously, because they'll be losing energy. They would go for the food particle, and as soon as they do that, they consume the food particle, and the predator consumes them. So it's ambushing. It's very interesting uh, kind of evolved behavior. I don't think it's popular. You know, it's because it's a flat land. It's, I doubt anything more can be evolved out of that. Uh, and of course, forex trading. I've also applied it to that. Uh, results, obviously if the results were any good, I wouldn't be sharing them. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can apply them to uh, Forex trading. You can either use directly the sliding window of uh, closing prices or the actual image. Now, what I, one of the methods that uh, I was exploring last year is the actually using the, the actual image, the pattern, the geometrical pattern. Now, technical analysts, they they usually look at the patterns, right? They even have these names, you know, the, the head and shoulder pattern, the cup and handle pattern, the whole bunch of these things that they trade based on how the geometry looks. So instead of using just the numbers, I fed the substrate encoded system the actual image of the, the currency and the geometry of the graph. And it actually performed uh, better than, uh, than the standard one. Because, you know, even if there is actually no meaning in any of the technical analysis, the fact that so many people believe that it works, they behave appropriately to actually make the market behave in that way. So we can use them sort of because they believe in these uh, images to leverage it. Uh, here are some more generalization results. Not very good, but uh, making some profits, but uh, nothing I would hide, obviously. Uh, and finally, epitope prediction. It's uh, kind of similar to sequence analysis, but you're applying your neural network to predicting where on a protein you have epitopes. And this is a, a platform for this type of uh, bioinformatics research. So uh, in conclusion, I think that uh, Erling is, uh, can substantially leverage this particular research field. It's, it makes things so simple, it allows us to actually utilize all this available hardware and uh, without actually having to worry about the distribution itself. It, it takes care of so much. The mapping, like I said, there's no conceptual gap, which I believe is, uh, is very important because it allows you to create more complex systems. Even a single student starting from scratch can create an entire platform, which is kind of impressive. Um, Future applications is in cyber warfare, evolution of circuits. In cyber warfare, you basically have artificial life, but where the environment is not 2D or 3D, it's, it's a network. And the agents are programs, and the sensors are coming from the ports, the signals coming from the ports are the actual sensory information, and the actuators send uh, commands to use, for example, uh, parameterized metasploit uh, commands to attack other elements on the network. So you can use, uh, Network simulators like uh, NS2 to do this kind of work. This is something we're exploring. Uh, evolution of circuits is another approach. Instead of neurons, you have logic gates and larger, larger components. So this would be uh, something like you know, the way cyber warfare system would look like. The, again, this is escape, which is just a network, and you have the same approach for everything else. Uh, evolutionary robotics is another uh, field that I'm exploring. We're using the ROS and Gazebo. And here, uh, we're evolving uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles, which in this case, uh, the neurons are controlling simulated in 3D environment uh, quadcopters. If you're using ROS system, they actually provide you with models, so you can already have access to most of this. Uh, and they're constantly competing, so you're trying to create an arms race. And the agents are competing, trying, first of all, they, they're evolving to be able to actually fly and navigate, and two, to try to outmaneuver each other and kill each other. So it's the same as predator and prey, but three-dimensional space, and it has applications because after you're done, you can actually apply it uh, to actual robotic systems. So that's pretty much concludes it. Thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I'll not take them.
Yes. You mentioned in the beginning that you might be able to use the hot swapping, or you applied the use code to the hot code. Sure, sure, yes. Are you actually doing that? That's what we're exploring. We're not having good results yet, but uh, it's being explored right now, yeah. So there's a function for that. But uh, no good results yet. <laughs> yes? So how much of this is in your, in your book? Because I want to get that book, but it's just like, that's a, that's a, that expensive read that book. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it a free like, for all attendees? If please feel free to pitch your book right now. No, no, no. no uh, the, the, in the book, you basically build the entire system, the second generation of my original system. So you're building it from scratch, and you're applying it to financial analysis and artificial life. But basically, the content we have here is, like a, is it a summary of the progression? That yes, you yes. Only you do not uh, link uh, your system, you do not link the system to the gazebo or ROS in the book. So you don't do that, but you do artificial life and currency trading and build the entire system from scratch so you'll know how exactly how it works. And you have a code online. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a, it's full of references. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so in the biological model, if a lot of the, the information or the usefulness of, of the output is produced by the frequency uh, synchronization of the neurons, how could that be addressed in your life? Because your concurrency is controlled by the neurons. Right. Uh, so, you know, there's another neural network model based on uh, spiking neural networks. They take into account frequency encoding. But there is actually another uh, approach that also takes into account phase and frequency that does not require spiking neural networks. That actually work has been pioneered by uh, Naum Eisenberg in 71 in, in Soviet Union. He used complex numbers. Now, a complex number is, uh, represents both phase and frequency. And his neurons, well, but he does not do neural evolution. This is what I'm exploring now. His neurons are able to are significantly more powerful because of that. So that's one of the way you can handle it. You just use complex or quaternion uh, system instead of the standard one, and you get all of that without actually having to do frequency encoding, or actually without using spiking neural networks directly. And his system also works much better at classification, which uh, standard neural networks are not very good at neural evolution approaches. Yes. Um, you, in one of your examples, you talked about uh, uh, controlling quadcopters. Are you actually controlling hardware, or is that simulation? It's uh, well in Gazebo, your or player stage project, right? The things you see uh, controlling in a simulation can be directly transferred to actual robots. In my approach, I'm still working with the simulations, and, but you can, but it's the same drivers, which is, which is why they made the whole project. So you can go directly from simulation. To actual robotic systems. And are you modeling matrices then in your simulation as well? No. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry. Yes. So, in that neural, the copter example, is there anything you can do with the whatever you produce to program the copter? Is there anything you can do even about it after you've, you know, you've created that result? Like to understand, like, hey, is this thing going to? So you're talking about uh, analyzing the actual neural network for how exactly it works. That's, that's an old problem. Neural networks are pretty much, to a great extent, black boxes. When you get the results, you don't exactly know how it works. So no. At least not very well. Um, yes. Sure, yeah, yeah. So I think for that point, you could sort of you could start in multiple different beginning states and see, see what the topology is of the initial state and then toward the final state. Well, of course, you can, you can analyze the final initial topologies. In fact, the new system keeps track of the whole phylogenetic tree, so you can keep track of how and what mutations were added. You have this entire uh, database of the whole phylogenetic tree, which you can then later delete or data mine. So you can perform all of that, yes. And for generalization, if you're trying to evolve robust systems, for example, in artificial life, you 
the, the starting position are all different for different ages at different times. So you can sort of try to uh, push forward for a highly generalized uh, evolved neural networks. That project is still uh, very early stages. Yeah. So, so you understand what post testing is? Please elaborate. Okay, so, so um, uh, post testing is what happens when people um, they they write a sort of test tool which uh, deviates moderately from the standard. So, for instance, people will sort of write that the standard length for packets is this or whatever it is, right? So one of the That, that would definitely have to be done then. 